welcome to Health Talk. Today we have with us today um, Dr. J. Augusto Bastidas, a general surgeon at Los Gatos El Camino Hospital and Good Samaritan Hospital. And we're going to talk about what's new with bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery. And with me interviewing is Evelyn Ross, a master's of public health. And we're just going to tell the home audience and the studio audience that advances in weight loss surgery. So, Dr. Bastidas, what is new about weight loss surgery and why are people doing it? I think that um, there are several things that are new with um, bariatric surgery. Uh, weight loss surgery was first started several decades ago. And over the decades, we've learned how to uh, fine tune the operations and minimize complications. And probably the most important re uh, recent advance is that almost all the operations are now done laparoscopically. Laparoscopically is a minimally invasive way to do surgery with small incisions as opposed to the bigger incisions that we used to use 20 years ago. And people are having this done because, as we know, that there's an uh, epidemic of uh, obesity, and but only two, about 250 and 200,000 cases are done a year, and that's only 1% of the people who could be having it done. So tell us why do you think there's this problem? Like, what is obesity and why are we having a problem so getting this treated? The, the um, issue of obesity is very complicated. It has uh, biologic uh, um, underpinnings that are mostly genetic, but it also has a very strong uh, behavioral component and socioeconomic factors that significantly impact who becomes obese. And so uh, probably before we get started, we should just define obesity. And so there's this concept uh, referred to as BMI, which is a relation, which is a, a way to try to standardize weight for how tall you are. And so there, you can go online and get your BMI calculator. You put in your height and your weight, and it gives you a number. And a normal BMI is in the low 20s, and anything over 40 is considered uh, significantly obese. And traditionally, a BMI of 40 was the indication for bariatric surgery. For many years, a BMI of 35 with some kind of complication from your obesity, such as diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, was an indication to consider bariatric surgery. Uh, just this past year, the guidelines and um, recommendations have been changed so that patients who have a BMI of 30, which is a significant drop now, can be considered for bariatric surgery as we've learned how uh, effective bariatric surgery can be, particularly in the management and control of diabetes. Uh, it's become more acceptable to operate on patients who are not as obese as they have been in the past. Now, there are lots of barriers as to why uh, patients who could benefit from bariatric operation are, uh, are never considered for an operation or choose not to have it. Okay, so the first issue is access. And as you know, we have a big problem in this country for general access to physicians for general health care. That's, that's the first problem, and we will need several hours to discuss how to deal with that. Um, of patients who actually get to physicians, uh, there's still a bias and by primary care providers that surgery is not a good idea for weight loss. And that's a perception of whether obesity is really a disease and a misunderstanding that choosing to diet is actually an effective way to keep weight loss. And we have known for many, many, many years that yes, if you have somebody who's very overweight, they can go on a diet they can modify their behavior, do a little exercise, but they have to modify their diet. We'll talk about calories and physics in a little bit. They can do that and they can lose 100 pounds, but the data is very clear that only a very small percentage of patients two years later have been able to maintain that weight off. So it's not a good long-term solution. It does work, 
and some patients do benefit significantly from it, and some are very successful in maintaining weight. And so, uh, obviously, dieting and, and caloric restriction and modifying behavior is always the first thing that you try. The problem is that uh, other factors really uh, prevent long-term success, and those are mostly genetic. Patients are programmed to be at a certain weight. The body is programmed to uh, store excess calories. And, you know, when you first start to diet, for example, the first thing your body does is turn into starvation mode and decrease the total number of calories that your body needs. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know the basic law of physics is you have conservation of energy. And so anybody who's overweight is eating more calories than what's needed to maintain a normal weight. Calories in has to equal calories out to keep a stable weight. If you're overweight, the only way to lose weight is to decrease calories in less than what your body needs. You have to, that's the only way you're gonna burn your excess weight. So when you start to diet, the first thing that happens is you need even fewer calories. And that's why exercise is, a, is an important component of trying to reduce weight. Exercise alone doesn't burn that many calories, but it does burn some, and, and, it's, and it helps overall conditioning. Uh, and so it's very complicated to proceed and succeed with, with, with diet alone. So surgery intervenes with this physiology. Correct. And so uh, maybe what we should do is uh, uh, review what normal physiology is, how is it that nutrition occurs. And so I brought a little figure here that I drew this morning that goes over basic anatomy. And this is essential for us to then st uh, understand the operations. So we have our swallowing tube known as the esophagus. It gets the food from the mouth to the stomach. And then we have the stomach, which is like a sac, and the food sits there. It, it functions as a reservoir. And then it slowly released into the small intestine. And the small intestine is the most important component of the gastrointestinal tract in terms of digestion. This is where all the absorption of nutrients occurs. You can actually live without a stomach. You can live without a large intestine. You can't wow. live without your small intestine. That's where all the absorption occurs. So the stomach, although it does start some of the breakdown of the food, is really mostly a reservoir. And there are a few and there are, uh, specific things that occur in the stomach that help with digestion. But essentially, you can think of the small intestine as responsible for all the absorption. The food gets to the large intestine as liquid, and the large intestine really just converts the residual liquid to solid stool, so then you can evacuate when it's socially appropriate. All right, and so the operations that are done have to impact uh, either intake or what gets absorbed. And uh, so if you want, I can go through the various operations that are uh, common and explain how they work, and then we can talk about the pros and cons of, of those. So let's start with the operations. Our so, studio audience and home audience want to know. So one of the most uh, uh, common operations that's done is referred to as a lap band, a laparoscopic mm -hmm. band procedure. The concept in this procedure is that you put a band in the upper part of the stomach and literally pinch off the upper stomach so that when you eat, this little proximal pouch fills easily and patients don't eat as much because they feel full. And so this is a restrictive operation. That's how this works. The patients then learn to eat small amounts, and they can actually adjust this band. It's an adjustable band. It has a little balloon inside the ring, and it's connected to a little reservoir. And you can make this tighter or looser depending on how the patient is doing and where they are in their weight loss. Because as they lose weight, you actually have to tighten it a little bit because the stomach gets smaller as well. Mm. So this is a very common procedure. One of the advantages of this procedure is that it's done as outpatient surgery. It doesn't require hospitalization. It's uh, 
uh, very safe and uh, moderately effective. Personally, I'm not a big proponent of this operation because I don't think it changes underlying physiology. This one, the first one, this lap band, you have to have like multiple visits to change the saline if somebody's injecting Correct. the saline. So, so the band is placed and then you have to come into the office to have this little reservoir adjusted to tighten it appropriately to calibrate how much you can swallow and how well you can swallow. So for this one though, like you would only be able to eat a really small portion, right? So are patients having to eat like several times a day or do they, do they have the sensation of like being really hungry? Um, so uh, that's one, one of the reasons I don't like this operation oh, okay. is that um, the regulation of hunger mm -hmm. is not altered in this operation. Oh, okay. okay. And we'll go over how that is. We uh -huh. actually uh, don't fully understand how hunger is, is regulated. There are three different things that are regulated by the brain. One is satiety, mm -hmm. satiation, and hunger. And they're independently regulated. Okay. Okay, now let's jump to what's yes. referred to as the gold standard. Okay. This is the Roux and Y gastric bypass. This is the current operation that we have the most experience with. We've been doing this operation for decades. Originally it was done with a bigger incision. Now they're virtually all done laparoscopically with little incisions. Yeah, this does require hospitalization. And this, like every other operation, um, changes the way you eat the rest of your life. So the first thing I tell patients when we begin a discussion about weight loss reduction through surgical methods is that no matter which method you choose, you have to understand that you will never eat normally ever again. Hmm. And most patients stop right there. Yeah. People enjoy eating. And when you tell them you're never going to eat what you consider as normal eating ever again, they're not going to want to continue the discussion. And I emphasize that because that's exactly what all these operations do. They change the way you eat. So that explains part of why even if they get to a doctor and their doctor understands that surgery is a good option, as soon as they're told that it changes the way they, they eat the rest of their lives, they're not going to be able to go out and have a Big Mac and a big thing of fries and a big soda and eat it in five minutes. That's that's not possible, okay? So let me go over uh, what's been considered the gold standard. It's the Roux and Y gastric bypass. Now the Roux and Y just has to do with how we reconnect the small intestine. So in the, the Roux and Y gastric bypass has both a restrictive component and a malabsorption component. So it's a combination of the two approaches that we use to bariatric surgery. The stomach, the upper part of the stomach, is actually divided, leaving a little pouch of stomach here. And then the small intestine is divided down here, and we bring the small intestine up here. That's the Roux and Y. This is a very common surgical technique that we use for a bunch of different things. And you connect the little pouch to the small intestine. And by doing this, you've actually taken this part of the small intestine and disconnected it from the flow of food. Oh. So food comes down the esophagus directly into the small intestine, but you've bypassed a segment of small intestine, so you've shortened the amount of small intestine that's available for absorbing nutrients. So the Roux Y gastric bypass has both a restrictive component in that you make a little pouch here so you can't eat big meal fast and it has a malabsorption component in that not all the small intestine is available to absorb nutrients. So this operation is considered the gold standard because you get very effective predictable weight loss. Usually the rule of thumb is that you lose 60 percent of your excess body weight. Wow. So if you're 200 pounds overweight, you're going to lose, you know, 60% of that, 120 pounds. Yeah. Okay. 
by losing that, that almost always gets rid of your diabetes and decreases your high blood pressure. Wow. Yeah. Now, these operations, when we first started doing them, were very controversial but, and required that you pay cash. Over the years, as we've proven their efficacy, insurance companies now basically pay for all the uh, standard operations, which are the, uh, the gastric bypass and the sleeve resection we're going to talk about. They don't usually pay for the uh, band. Why is that? Because it's not considered as effective. Okay. Okay, so band operations uh, usually are, are, are not as well covered by insurance. Okay. But insurance figured out that for patients who are actually obese, BMIs of 35 with comorbidities like diabetes and high, pr high blood pressure or BMIs of over 40, the insurance companies figured out that it's cheaper for them to pay for the operation up front, get rid of the comorbidities, and not have to pay downstream for all the complications of being overweight. So this operation we have decades of data on, and it is um, a complicated operation, as you can see. It involves some uh, rerouting of the plumbing, and, th and consequently it has uh, more complications than the other operations that are uh, um, a little simpler. And so very effective and still what everything is, is compared to. A very popular operation that's becoming more and more popular that, we're, that we have less experience in this uh, country is called the gastric sleeve resection. In this situation, you do not change any of the small intestine you instead remove most of the stomach and convert the stomach from a big sac to a little tube. And as you can imagine, this operation is not reversible. Just like the gastric sleeve isn't really reversible, although you can reroute the plumbing. Uh, the lap band, you can take the band out, and usually that's, that can reverse it uh, pretty well. The gastric sleeve seems to work because we've discovered that there's a hormone called ghrelin that's produced in the stomach, and by taking the stomach out, your ghrelin levels drop immediately, and hunger goes away. And so one of the big advantages of this operation is you walk around and you're not very hungry. The diabetes is extremely well controlled with this operation. And so this operation is now also approved by most insurance and is very effective. And in comparing it to the gastric bypass, the longer European data shows that they're almost equivalent. You get similar weight loss, similar overall success in terms of longevity of the weight loss. And so this operation is becoming more and more popular because it's a little bit safer in terms of the surgical complications compared to the Ruin Y gastric bypass. So this sleeve and the Ruin Y are now considered very good in terms of outcome of weight loss. Correct. And so my personal bias is that if a person needs a bariatric procedure, they should consider a sleeve or a bypass. Now, the bypass, I think, is a better operation for what we refer to as the super obese. Somebody who's four or 500 pounds. Although they're starting to do sleeves in those patients as a precursor to the bypass because it's a s technically simpler operation and safer. So you can do a sleeve first, s let the patient lose 100 or 200 pounds, and then if they still need to lose more weight, you can then convert them to to a bypass if necessary. And so if they do the sleeve first and they do the Ruin Y second, they can stu still do it laparoscopically? Yes. So all these operations can be done laparoscopically. A sleeve resection is usually a hospitalization of 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And it, like the other operations, changes the way you eat. Your diabetes goes away quickly. You don't have hunger and you learn new um, behaviors about eating. You can't eat fast. It has a restrictive component. This is a small tube. You're not going to be able to eat very fast. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it has uh, uh, become very popular. So let's say somebody has the gastric sleeve operation and they stay in the hospital 48 hours, okay, then they go home, how do they feel? So uh, the main reason they stay in the hospital is that at first it's very hard to drink enough water and fluid to stay hydrated. So when you first go home after this operation, you're on a liquid diet and you have to be drinking a small amount all the time just to maintain hydration. Oh. And because you can't eat very much at first, you also have to uh, follow your protein intake very carefully to make sure you get enough protein so you don't become protein deficient. Eventually, yeah. uh -huh. as the swelling and everything and things settle down and patients learn to eat with their new stomach, they can sit down and have a pretty normal meal. But small. But slowly. And small. And small. Yeah. yeah. And the, these, uh, all these patients have small meals and they have to chew their food a lot so it be so it goes into a, because it's going to a smaller pouch, no Correct. more. Correct. Yeah. yeah, you cannot take a big bite of meat and expect it to get through this tube and have it feel okay. Mm -hmm. you, know, if, if, uh, you know, the meats are the hardest to, to swallow and they have to chew them very, very well. Otherwise, they have one bite, it kind of gets stuck and they don't, don't feel like eating. Mm -hmm. And then they won't get enough nutrition. And it's uncomfortable for the first, like, six weeks post-op, or how long do they feel uncomfortable? Because, you know, they're, they're being stapled. It depends on how well they adapt. Oh, to if the they diet. they learn to eat slowly and to chew well, then they don't get as much discomfort. But if they don't chew well or try to eat too fast, both things are, are bad, mm -hmm. <laughs> then they're going to feel it and things will get sort of stuck in the stomach. So you saying stuck in the stomach? So they feel it as a stomach ache, or they feel like gas pain? You know, gas. You know, well, if they overeat too much, they'll get pain, or they'll just feel full, which okay. is the whole principle to feel mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. full quickly. With the Ruin Y, traditionally they this more extensive procedure. This one probably takes like two hours to do. And yeah, this takes a little longer because there is a little more, but it's not a very uh, a uh, long uh, time under anesthesia. And this probably takes longer in terms of the patient to adapt to their diet because you've changed, you know, you've hooked the stomach to the small intestine, so they have to Correct. They have so, a different So the reason that absorption. this operation works, we're not 100% sure, but there are the different components. There is clearly a restrictive part where you can't eat fast. Mm -hmm. Then there is a phenomenon that when food goes directly into the small intestine, ordinarily the small intestine sees food coming out of the stomach that's isotonic. When food, which is not isotonic, it's uh, uh, hyperosmolar, when food gets directly into the small intestine, there's a thing referred to as dumping. Mm -hmm. There's this dumping syndrome gives you uh, funny sensations that's uncomfortable. And so you they actually- feel gas? Um, it, it's different from patient to patient, but basically fluid rushes into the small intestine to try to balance the osmolarity. And in doing so, they, they, they get a discomfort. They just don't feel good when they eat, particularly huh. with carbohydrates. So one of the other reasons this operation works is if you eat too much carbohydrate, you're just not going to feel good. And so you learn not to eat so much. That'll and fix that, diabetes. And so, and, and so that's a negative reinforcement to eating. And then the third component, obviously, is that you malabsorb. Now, dumping also has this phenomenon that because of uh, particularly of the carbohydrates, you can end up with diarrhea after you eat. So there are, there are uh, uh, a lot of things that occur with the gastric bypass that contribute to the overall decrease in how much the patient's going to eat. So do those symptoms kind of last? They're very variable. Some patients okay. get them, others don't. Okay. Uh, and some patients have persistent dumping. Okay. Dumping is a phenomenon that can occur in any gastric operation. It's not well sure. understood, and its incidence is variable. Okay. But uh, most of us feel that part of why this operation works, it's not just restrictive. Mm -hmm. It's because of 
whatever dumping is that gives a negative feedback to the eating on top of the fact that you don't have your entire small bowel now to mm -hmm. actually absorb everything. Now, do the patients, I mean, are they getting all the nutrients they need now that they're not, like the food isn't going through the whole absorption? So historically, we used to do operations where you had even smaller amounts of the intestine mm -hmm. available to contact the food to absorb food and we ran into all sorts of metabolic problems, and those okay. operations are, are not done anymore. Okay. This operation continues to leave patients at risk for some malabsorption issues. Specifically, iron absorption and calcium absorption has to be watched very carefully in these patients, as well as B12 absorption. Okay. The reason iron and calcium is an issue is that this part of the intestine here, the upper intestine, that no longer is seeing food mm -hmm. is where most of the iron and calcium is absorbed. Oh, I see. And so the body does adapt some, but patients are at risk for iron malabsorption and calcium. B12 uh, absorption is altered because of uh, a complicated mechanism as to how B12 is absorbed. You need a, a factor from the stomach. And so we know historically that when you do this operation, and when you do the sleeve resection, uh -huh. you alter B12 absorption, so you have to supplement with B12. Okay. So many people have had this surgery now for 10, 20 years, because this has been done. And so um, do they do well with their weight loss? I know that their diabetes is almost gone, and that's a big plus for health insurance and longevity of life. So what's, you know, what's the general surgeons think about this? Now so they the, these operations are very effective. Having said that, some patients do fail. They'll lose their weight and then over time they'll regain weight. And so it's because of uh, failures that there's a very detailed evaluation before surgery as to how well people will adapt. Um, there's, for example, most, many surgeons still require psychiatric evaluation so you can learn about behavioral characteristics and predict patients that might fail. We're in the last 30 seconds of our show. The take home message is if you are overweight and you have comorbid conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, talk to your family physician and discuss what can be done and you do not have to think that it is just because you're a bad person and that you're just weak in your mind, but that it's genetic components and that much is understood about obesity, but not enough, and that physiologically we can intervene with these new techniques which are very small incision. And very effective. Thank you for joining us today.